Thank you all so much for coming. And I know a lot of people are also joining us via the live stream. I know many of your professors and others have mentioned that they're very excited to see what you all do tonight. Um, you are here at the class of 2022's final presentations. Woohoo! Um, Y'all, these folks have worked really, really hard for a year and a half. Um, and they have done work that is incredibly meaningful and impactful to the communities that they've chosen to serve. And we hope today that they'll inspire you with some new ideas of things that journalists can do um, to really serve communities in new ways. Um, each student that you're gonna see presenting today chose a community that they want to work with. You'll see a very wide range of different types of communities. Some of them are geographic, but others are much broader than that. Folks united by some kind of shared interests or needs. Um, they've listened to these communities, tried to understand what their information needs were, tried to build less transactional relationships with folks in these communities, and they've also looked beyond even traditional storytelling for ways to reach people who really need information. Um, being as creative as possible, whether that's you know, text messages or zines, um, to get to people that sometimes traditional journalism has historically left out. Um, these folks will graduate in just two days, becoming masters of engagement journalism. Um, but I think what you will see here is what they've, what they've done is really beyond a credential. You know, journalism really needs more than ever people that are going to help reinvent it and build a better and more sustainable future. And that's what you're about to see here today. Um, we won't have a Q&A at the end of each presentation, not though, because we don't want your questions or your feedback, but just because otherwise we would be here till very late at night and that would be suboptimal for us all. However, um, each of the students will have a closing slide with information about how you can contact them. We also have a program with a bunch of links in it. Um, you can find that uh, linked on our school uh, Twitter account as well as mine, Brizzy C. Um, it also has sort of the, the students are listed in the order in which they'll present today. Um, and we certainly encourage you to come find them afterwards as well if you have any questions. You know, and many of them are on the job market, so you may want to uh, hire them. Um, you know, last, I just want to introduce a couple of folks. Um, we have our brand new dean, Graciela, is here with us today. Uh, Jeff Jarvis, who helped start the program. Christine uh, and Lexi, who are the professors of the Community Practicum class, and who, you know, more than I did, helped shepherd all of these folks to get to today. So. Um, rock on, we are ready to go. <laughs> All right, so our first presenter, come on up. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Angraj and my community of focus are Afghan refugees who were evacuated in August of last year after the Taliban seized power in Afghanistan. By late September, tens of thousands of Afghan refugees arrived to the United States. And a month later, many community organizations formed and stepped up to help Afghan refugees resettle from the, from the military bases that they were on to homes across the United States. During the resettlement process, I was connected to a fa Afghan family at Fort McCoy, Wisconsin, which 
basically led me to a story I wrote about their experiences here in the United States, which weren't delightful. Um, and they were really covered, covered by the mainstream media, and, and the mainstream media was just focused on the journey to the United States. Um, after that, the stories about their experiences uh, were not covered. Um, so to, to narrow down the focus, because I, you know, th they traveled to many different states, I FOIA'd New York's Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance Office, um, and the data show that there were about 3,000 Afghan Iraqis in the United, uh, uh, sorry, in New York alone. Um, and the closest count to me was uh, New York City, uh, which there were about 317 Afghan refugees, and most of them are in Brooklyn. Um, so to, to get acquainted with the community in New York City, I traveled to many Afghan re restaurants from Dunya Kebab to Afghan Grill to Halal Express to Bakhtar Kebab to Sambora Restaurant. <laughs> the food was good. <laughs> um, at that last place and restaurant that I met, I met a woman um, who also works at um, Women from Afghan Women. Uh, which is basically a nonprofit organization that focuses on helping resettle to helping with housing and all the stuff that Afghan refugees need. While I was going from restaurant to restaurant, I wanted to find out how food connects to the community, how they contribute to the Afghan community, and how they see their community succeeding, um, and how they're helping Afghan refugees. And after the first connection, um, I emailed back uh, Women for Afghan Women, and this was my third attempt uh, because they were just so busy and so backlogged with all of the um, um, issues that they were tackling. From the having conversations with um, community members in this organization, uh, you found out that uh, there were about five main things that Afghan refugees needed help with from community, to food, to housing, to employment, to learning a second language, which was English. Um, currently, um, the organization does offer um, some sort of English classes, and typically they meet for three hours. Um, currently, there's about 58 students enrolled in three different levels of English classes, from beginner to intermediate to hard. And something that they expressed to me was that they would love to offer some sort of English language online courses to help for their goals. So that's beyond just uh, three hours a week. So I am in the process of uh, continuing to build out a Facebook chatbot, which lives on a Facebook page called Afghan Resource Hub, uh, which is intended to help unite the community and to help um, other community members share resources um, that relate from housing to mutual aid. Um, in this Facebook chatbot, uh, you can ask anything from um, whether you want to go from one place to another, whether you want to translate something from English to their language, um, anything that you can see fit, uh, there will be a response that's uh, created by me um, and feedback from the community. Uh, this is an example of what a link that I created uh, would take you to. So if they're looking for something like, oh, what are Afghan lit uh, restaurants near me? It, it would take you to this map and you can explore different venues and the map will also give you directions to go to that um, uh, establishment. Um, and some of the metrics that I'm tracking for success um, within the space of chatbots are the number of users who are joining uh, the Facebook page, but the number of uh, messages that uh, people are sending, and the number of times that each, each time a link is clicked, which takes them to something useful. Um, so what's next? Um, I ha I'm very ambitious to scale this Facebook chatbot and to give the source coding, coding to other Afghan-led um, organizations around the United States and to help them create their own Facebook chatbot and serve any specific needs that may be within their er their own areas, and and continuing to make these Facebook chatbot a little bit more natural, <laughs> which I know can be scary, 
Um, and some, some of the things that I learned from the engagement program here at the school, but also from working with the community, is that relationships take time to develop, they take trust, and they take time. Um, and that persistence is self-discipline and action. If it wasn't for me continuing to reach out to um, African organizations, if it wasn't for me to continue to reach out, going to different restaurants across New York City and Long Island, it wouldn't have been possible. Um, so, and then just trying to find that um, areas of levels of engagement in so many different places rather than just online. And three is priority and public needs leads to service. Um, if it wasn't for me <laughs> choosing this community, I'd, this Facebook chat bot probably wouldn't have existed. Um, finding out their information needs uh, wouldn't have been um, listened to. And, um, and if you guys have more questions, uh, you're more than welcome to reach out to me on email or find, reach out to me on Twitter. So, yeah. Hi, everybody. How's everyone going? Yay, awesome. Me too, I think. So, <laughs> um, my name is Ina Isham. Um, I will be presenting you guys a community that I've been serving for about 15 months, which is the Two Bridges neighborhood, a small but mighty community. And you might be wondering, who are they? And where are they? And just to zoom out a bit, here, we're, here is where we are right now in Midtown. And they're actually right at the bottom right here. They're at Lower Manhattan, and there's a better map in New York Times. They're kind of sandwiched between Chinatown and Lower East Side. And the name kind of comes off the fact that they're in between the Brooklyn Bridge and the Manhattan Bridge. And who are they? So they're all mostly are low to working class families and a lot of them are mostly immigrants from South America to Asia and Europe. But what kind of problems are they actually facing? After like working with them for a while, here's a few that I could tell, which is one of it is indirect displacement. So they are being like threatened to be like kicked out by, the, by like a bunch of developers because they're a bunch of people who are trying to make skyscrapers and like, you know, really expensive apartments within an area. And people are scared. They are really concerned and they have been trying to fight back for a while and they still are today. And like, while I was just researching and looking at the reports and everything, there is actually a lack, uh, there's like a huge like, there are like less reports of like um, people reporting on the view of the residents. There's been a lot of reporting on like, you know, maybe there are lawsuits, there are developers doing this and that. But honestly, there's really not a lot from the point of view of a resident. And that's, I thought was really eye-opening to me. And another thing that I noticed while working with them is that they always talk about the lack of affordable groceries. They keep talking about the grocery stores that closed down because they got because they're being replaced by other skyscrapers. So I thought that was really interesting and I they think this is a huge problem and I think that is something I will look into. And uh, with the help of this call out that I had a few months ago, which honestly helped me inform me and what I could do better like to serve them, they kind of tell me their concerns, their problems, their worries. It just gave me an idea what I could do better. And I got a few responses. I had like zero expectations on this, but I got a few. I got like eight responses and I got a bunch of clicks, which were still pretty interesting to me. And I had some interesting findings from all the pool of like responses I got. So about 75% think that their expenses have increased a lot in terms of rent, bills, etc. And like 62.5% don't know that there are people building these bunch of like skyscrapers within the neighborhood, which I think is also really eye-opening. 
And with all the results that I've, I mean, I've, that I've gotten from this, I kind of decided to go to the focus on affordable groceries because I feel that too many people are talking about it directly to me. I go to every, I, the people I meet, they always, always talk about there is this market path mark that was closed down 10 years ago and a few years later was replaced with a skyscraper, which I thought that was insane to me. And I think that's, that is something that I should be addressing at this moment, I think. And with that, I feel that the goal for the, for the work I'm doing is to like fill the information gaps that are like obviously not being filled up. No, and people obviously have problems that they, that they have in the, in the neighborhood and no one's really doing much about it. So I think maybe I could be the person to help with that. So what did I do? So I did a bunch of things. And online, I've done some stories in my blog. I did one on the protest they had la last year. I've done a bunch of collabs. I did a news package with one of the nonprofits. Mostly I, I worked with a lot of nonprofits. They kind of gave me a lot of insight and everything. Okay, this is a news package. And I made an Instagram page. I did two British voices. I kind of like met up with a bunch of ladies here, as you can see, where I talked to them about their, you know, insight about gentrification within the neighborhood and et cetera. And another thing I also emph emphasize a lot is offline outreach. This neighborhood, I feel that they respond so much better offline <laughs> and more in person, basically. So I, I try my best to actively, you know, meet them where they are, which is community meetings they have, protests. I also, with the call I had earlier, I did a flyer and I went around like, the neighborhood from like, community uh, centers to libraries, all the public spaces I could find, I kind of put it around. I even shared out the call out here, this flyer, to like a bunch of the people that I was speaking with, and they shared it on with their people, so that was cool. And the best part is I went shopping with some of these ladies. So yeah, I kind of like the reason why I went grocery shopping in the first place is because that I felt that I wanted to see where they go after all these like expensive stores have been coming up and all that. So I thought, hey, why don't I just like, you know, just join them shopping? So th this one, this lady here, Elaine, I, she went to Chelsea and I kind of went with her all the way from the Lower East Side. That was fun. Um, this is Louisa. We went to Borough Park all the way from Lower East Side, so that was fun. It was probably, I think this is the furthest I went for shopping from the Lower East Side. And this is Rosa, so she's really cool. So she has like a sprained ankle and she has not done much about it, she doesn't want to, but she still like makes effort to go shopping within Lower East Side. And honestly, while I was shopping with her, it took her about like, I think total two hours when it's really nearby. So I like her, yeah, so she, kind of limps and all that, but I usually help her out, kind of like help her shopping too, so that was also fun. And with all that, what did I learn? So one thing, I was, one thing I've learned, honestly, I was very inspired by the community as like, I feel that they get so empowered from like just listening to what they could do, you know, to empower themselves. Like if they want to write a letter to, you know, their representatives and all that kind of stuff. Like, them being able to learn about something is like powerful to me and that kind of re just reminded me of like why I learned the program like just listening actively is important so that's something that I thought I'd learned but I actually haven't so that's crazy and showing up is honestly so important even if it's like offline online all that like just showing your face out there being there not being like transactional is important I feel that the ladies that I spoke with when I showed earlier yeah, I feel like they're like family to me at this point, so, see? They kind of treat, I was interviewing them at, at on this day, actually, and they were actually feeding me halfway. I'm like, I should be focusing on interviewing guys. Please stop feeding me. <laughs> so they're great. So future plans. So I'm doing a service journalism piece on like basically like mapping out all the shopping journeys I had with those ladies earlier, just to see like the struggles they had to go through, like from train, et cetera, to commute. And another thing I'm doing is a postcard guide. I thought that it would be cool to do one that's like more inclusive and not just like do an online like resource website, but more of like I could at least have live somewhere physical. So that's why I made this is like the mock up design for now. I'm trying to work with like nonprofits within the area to like get this out at some point to hopefully like guide them into like find more affordable spots within or nearby the area. So that's kind of like 
Yeah. And with that, I thank you guys for listening to my talk. And if you need me, I am here. This is me. And this is my email. And just follow Taylor's voices. Thank you. Um, hi, all. It's great to see um, some familiar and new faces. Uh, I am Sarah Left, and you probably guessed I'm here to talk about engagement journalism, uh, specifically addressing information needs for New Yorkers living with long COVID. If you're unfamiliar with long COVID, uh, the term refers to long-lasting health problems following a COVID-19 infection, uh, and it's not one thing. Um, so there's a huge range of symptoms and severity uh, from mild uh, to severely debilitating. And over the past year, I've spoken to 75 people, people with long COVID, uh, clinicians, caregivers, and scientists. One person I spoke with um, still hasn't regained her sense of smell. Uh, another person who's a, a triathlete in their 20s was bedbound for months. And one young mom, uh, two years after infection, still can't take her son to the playground uh, because she can't catch him if he runs, uh, thanks to some dysregulation of her nervous system uh, that messes with things like breathing and heart rate and balance. And so who does this affect? Well, between 20 to 30% of New Yorkers who've had COVID-19 report some form of long COVID. Again, a huge range in uh, severity there. This adds up to one in 12 New Yorkers uh, statewide. And in the city alone, this is a population that is 14, uh, that could fill Yankee Stadium 14 times over. Um, and it's five times the population of residents with HIV. Women are more likely to report symptoms than men. And in the city, Latinos across the city and residents of the Bronx are also reporting disproportionate rates of long COVID. The CDC has recorded 3,500 long COVID deaths, which experts say are a vast undercount uh, in the past year. And so in short, this is an ongoing public health crisis. And so where does engaged journalism fit in? Well, from listening, um, I learned that there are a few common challenges. For one, there's a lack of understanding about post-viral conditions. Uh, long COVID is not the first. Um, there are many viruses that can cause long-lasting health problems. Historically, these have been understudied and underfunded relative to disease burden. Um, and often dismissed as women's anxiety. And while this isn't the case, um, this has led to difficulty finding supportive and knowledgeable medical care for many folks. People are also dealing with social stigma and loss of income um, when they're too ill to work. And in the face of these challenges, the community has come together to share information, um, to coin the term long COVID, uh, to work with the CDC and the NIH on public policy, uh, to form advocacy and support groups, and even to conduct patient-led research. Learning about these strengths and challenges helped me understand where engaged journalism could provide value. Uh, journalism alone can't tackle all these problems, uh, but it can address gaps in information. And so there's a wealth of information online, but it's scattered across government agency websites, hospital websites, um, buried deep in support groups, some of which are uh, more reliable than others. Uh, and it can be daunting to know where to start. And so I set out to amplify community insights in an easy to navigate spot, uh, bridging gaps uh, between isolation and community and confusion and direction 
and misinformation and knowledge. To do this, I partnered with The City, a nonprofit newsroom in New York, on the Missing Them project. Missing Them began as a digital memorial to remember New Yorkers who've died from COVID-19. As the pandemic has evolved, so has the project. It's now focused in part on understanding the ongoing needs of New Yorkers. The city's Missing Them team paired up with community organizations around the city uh, to host community conversation events. So this photo is from an event in Harlem and we collectively talked one-on-one -on -one with more than 75 New Yorkers to hear about their questions and challenges. Inevitably, long COVID came up. And so I'm working with the city to produce a dedicated series about this topic. So this started with a reported piece about the state of long COVID in New York City, looking at impact and prevalence. And that story has a call out form um, to scale community engagement. And to ensure that we're reporting um, with and for, and not just about New Yorkers with long COVID, we're asking for their questions, uh, for their insights and advice for fellow New Yorkers and for loved ones of those with long COVID. We're distributing the call out form far and wide um, with a mix of online direct and offline engagement. So far, I've reached out to more than a dozen long COVID advocacy and support groups. And we'll reach out to more community health organizations, clinicians groups, um, and mutual aid orgs. And we'll share it in relevant online gathering spaces and hope to spread the word with more direct community conversations. In the meantime, the story was republished and inspired coverage in a number of outlets. Originally published by the city in both English and Spanish, it was republished by Documented City Limits and Welcome to the Bronx. It inspired a segment on Telemundo and a New York One morning show. And since it went live in late November, so just about two weeks, um, we've heard back from around 30 New Yorkers who've shared questions like, why is this lasting so long? I can't remember my walk. How come this is happening to more people in the Bronx? Is it our food? Is it safe to get vaccinated if I'm experiencing long COVID? So I'm currently working on a service journalism guide on finding help, medical, social, and financial that will include insights and advice from community members, clinicians, and scientists around the city. From there, we'll continue this model of engaged journalism. We've heard positive feedback from community members about the project. One, that it's needed, and that this kind of journalism is a powerful tool for amplifying community voices. This morning on a call, I heard from a, the head of a long COVID clinic that this project is an important part of the information system that helps folks access care. And so I wanna share some lessons I've learned to carry forward. Uh, first is to listen deeply and test everything. These are two parts of a whole. Listen first, test second, repeat. Is the content produced valuable for the audience you're intending? Uh, two, to center relationships and impact. In other words, people first, stories second. In engagement journalism, great stories are great, but they're the means, not the end. Meeting information needs is the goal. For my reporting, this meant building sustainable relationships and slowing down the process. Folks with chronic illnesses often have flare-ups and may need to cancel or reschedule an interview, uh, and health came first. And then three, make journalism accessible. So I'm referring to the end product, of course, like is your video captioned, um, but I'm also referring to the process. I took a cue from journalist Fiona Lowenstein, um, who has long COVID herself and is the founder of Body Politics Long COVID Support Group, one of the largest out there. She started asking her sources during outreach if there were any accommodations that she could provide. This takes the onus off the source and opens up a conversation about interview format. 
And so with debilitating fatigue and brain fog, someone might not be able to take a call, but they still might be able to share their story in writing. When we fail to create accessible ways of participating in the reporting process, uh, we fail to include folks in it, leaving whole groups out. And so in closing, I just want uh, to thank the team at the city for supporting and allowing me to do this work with them and the Missing Them team, specifically Anjali Tusi and Melissa DePinto, who have been great collaborators. And I wanna uh, thank community members who've taken the time to talk, uh, as well as the community here at the J School and specifically the engagement program um, for creating a container for this work um, to do ethical and engaged journalism. So thank you all. All right, hi everybody. So my name is Julia and I am going to talk to you today about my work with the purity culture deconstruction community and what I've learned about engagement journalism over the last 15 months. So before we can talk about who the purity culture deconstruction community is, first we need to define purity culture. So purity culture is a phenomenon that occurs in conservative religious institutions when abstinence is used as a tool for control. So like this quote from author Linda K. Klein states, purity culture relies on teachings that are heteronormative, an emphasis on abstinence only, sex education, and anything that strays beyond those two teachings. So having sex before marriage or questioning one's own gender or sexuality, those are all things that are worthy of divine punishment and can cause the um, shame and trauma and all of these really difficult things for people who are taught those teachings in their religious institutions. And so the purity culture deconstruction community, they are a community that gathers primarily online and they are gathering together to unlearn the harmful, shameful beliefs that are taught to them about their sexualities and their bodies. And I see this community really as twofold. So there is the community that of content creators. They're the people who are creating TikToks and Instagram infographics and reels about their experiences and about the deconstruction process. And then there are people who are behind the screen. They're the audiences who are consuming that content as part of their healing journey, but they don't have a platform. Maybe they don't want a platform themselves, but they still need resources and a way to connect with one another. And that was the community that I wanted to serve. So in order to serve them effectively, I had to identify their information gaps. So I circulated this call out on my personal social media network, as well as through a couple of subreddits, and I received about a dozen or so responses. Then I collaborated with the Instagram content creator, Talk Purity to Me. She has 29,000 Instagram followers, and I asked her if she would graciously share this call out with her followers on her Instagram story. She agreed, and overnight I received about 190 responses on the call out. Since then, the response count has gr grown to 215. And I was able to pull some really interesting data and just understand it, what the deconstruction experience is like for a wide range of people. I also knew that I wanted to do a newsletter because TikTok and Instagram as informational platforms are so saturated with the deconstruction content that it, be, it can become very difficult to kind of weave through all of that information that's there. So I thought a newsletter would be a good way to curate some of the resources that are available to the community. So from that first call out, I um, allowed people, it was optional for people to leave me their contact information. I received 93 email addresses from that first call out, and I circulated the second call out, asking them, what content would you want to see in a deconstruction newsletter? What would be helpful to you? And here are some of the things that I found. So in that first call out, Evangelical Christianity was the religious denomination that contributed the most to purity culture teaching. So 
there were a number of denominations that were named on that form as the religion that introduced people to purity culture. Evangelical Christianity was kind of the top one. And then in terms of information gaps, what deconstructors are looking for is where to find in-person resources, support groups, and meetups so that they can connect with other deconstructors because the deconstruction process is incredibly isolating for a lot of deconstructors and they want to be able to make personal connections with people who have similar lived experience. And finally, the um, second most common information gap that I identified was where to find religious trauma and purity culture informed mental health resources, therapists, counselors, just information about the healing process, et cetera. So one of the reasons that deconstruction can be so isolating is because people really do have to gather online for their own safety and to kind of maintain their own anonymity. Um, a lot of deconstructors were born into the religion that introduced them to purity culture, and so the decision to deconstruct can often lead to a strain on their personal relationships with their friends, their family, their local community. It can even be a safety issue. So they want to, but still, they still want to connect with one another. They want to move beyond the TikToks and beyond the memes and really get to know one another on a personal level. And this was echoed to me by Andrew Pledger. He has been one of my, um, a great collaborator with me throughout this entire process. And he is a podcast host, a religious recovery coach. And he told me that what's been most helpful to him in his own healing process is the opportunity to attend a support group in person with other deconstructors in his local community. So I hosted a listening post in May. A listening post is kind of just a town hall type of event. I hosted it over Zoom and I invited my email list of 93 deconstructors. About a dozen of them showed up and I just talked to them like, hey, these are some of the experiences that you guys said you're having in your call out responses. Let's talk about that. And I wanted to put a face to the call out, help people really understand um, who it is that I was and why I was interested in speaking with them. <laughs> and then I also um, did an Instagram live with the creator Talk Purity to Me, who I mentioned earlier in the presentation. And we did this Instagram live the weekend after the Politico story about the leaked Roe v. Wade opinion dropped in May. And um, we were just talking with to one another about that intersection between right-wing politics and religion in the United States and how purity culture is often used as a tool for um, Republican uh, right-wing legislation such as anti-LGBTQ legislation and reproductive rights, et cetera. And then I was on Andrew's podcast and um, that was just an opportunity for me to introduce myself to his audience as well as share my ideas as an engagement journalist for how I could serve the deconstruction community and um, just to have a little bit more of uh, an introduction to what I wanted to do with them. So all of this has culminated into my newsletter, Unpure. It is a newsletter of curated events, support groups, meetups, mental health resources, and more that are all geared directly toward the deconstruction community. I sent out a call for submission to my existing email list. I also made an intro post about my own experiences deconstructing, and then um, I linked this form at the bottom of that intro post, and I received six responses, technically five, one of them was a duplicate, but um, so this is the first article. So all of that has culminated into this first article, and the people who responded, I consider them collaborators in this first Unpure article. Um, they are people like gr Stepping Forward Greenville, who are, suppo are a support group in Greenville, South Carolina, and uh, Mae Cowan, who is a purity culture informed sex and relationships coach. I have Kate Vance, she is a licensed therapist who practices in Kansas, who specializes in working with people who are from religious trauma backgrounds. And some of the impact that I've seen throughout my entire work with this community is that people are just excited to have a place where they can connect with one another, whether that's through a Zoom listening post. Um, and s I've also, some of the quantitative feed, uh, impact I've seen is that this call out, it's very exciting to me that over 200 people wanted to respond to it, goes to show that people do, in this community, really do want to have their stories told. They want someone to listen to them. 
Um, the subscriber count for Unpure has steadily grown as the first article was published, which means that people are finding the content compelling and helpful enough to subscribe. And finally, our first post had a 73% open rate, which is super exciting and shows that people were interested in the resources that were available to them. So my key takeaways for engagement journalism <laughs> is don't be afraid to pivot. So I had originally started this semester thinking that Unpure was going to be a newsletter of explainer articles about purity culture and, and the dangers of religious trauma. And I realized that if you've lived through purity culture, you don't need explainer articles about it. So the, the more effective way to serve my community was to take what I heard from listening to them and create this newsletter that was going to be more effective. So with that, thank you all so much. I'm available for questions online and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Hello, Beyonce's queen, period. Anyways, hi, my name's Hafiza. I use she, her pronouns, and for the past eight months now, I've been working with the New York City vendor community, and this is my project, New York City Vendor Voices, highlighting the stories of street vendors in New York. Where's the clicker? There we go. So the street vendor community is a community comprised of over 20,000 people. Um, this number has steadily grown since the COVID pandemic, when a lot of people lost their jobs and were looking for new ways to uh, gain income while the pandemic was raging on and still continues to rage on and continues to impact them and their resources. This community is comprised of people who are both veterans or uh, un undocumented immigrants or people who were born and raised in this country. They speak Hindi, Wolof, French, Spanish, all of the languages all across the city and its five boroughs. So these are the issues that I've learned from this community since I've started working from them. Um, harassment from the New York City uh, Police Department, as well as the Department of, uh, sorry, I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> as well as the Department of Consumer Worker Protection and brick and mortar owners. Um, one of my sources spoke to me about being harassed by a Payless owner for selling in front of their store. There are many other stories of brick and mortar uh, individuals stating that the New York City vendors are taking away from their business or making business around them worse. There's also a lack of transparency about how to get licenses and permits. Currently, less than 5,000 licenses and permits are in circulation from the New York City state, from New York City. And New York City recently announced, I want to say back in 2019, that they were going to increase permits by 400 each year, but doing 400 permits each year over 10 years is only 4,000 permits, number one, and number two will not make a dent again in this 20,000 person population that is New York City street vendors. Um, number three, there's a lack of access to financial aid. Like I stated, a lot of these vendors are undocumented, or if they do have some sort of basic documentation for their identities, they might not have financial documentation. They might not know how to maintain that documentation in order to prove that they're a business or to prove that they need some sort of financial aid from the government, whether it be state government or city government. There was an implementation uh, created called um, Fund Excluded Workers that came from the state, and this was to give money to those who were excluded from the first round of um, PP, uh, PCP um, from a uh, fund from the state um, when the COVID pandemic happened and many vendors were able to receive these funds but unfortunately they also had to give these funds back to the city once they were fined again for the work that they were doing because they were vending illegally. So it's just an endless cycle. And finally there's just a lack of action from city and state officials. Um, many officials have been continuously making promises to the street vendor community that things were going to change and that they would continue to receive information about when and when they, when and where they can get permits and or licenses. But from the vendors that I've spoken to on the ground, this has not happened. And many of them are still left wondering when is it our turn uh, to get our um, legal papers in order. 
Right now, it's not so easy to sell because we don't know when the police will arrive. Especially these past couple of months, they've been coming extra strong. This is a vendor who works in Corona Street Plaza in Jackson Heights, Queens. Uh, her name is Vanessa, and she's been vending for the past four years. Um, this is one of the many stories that vendors have continued to face. Um, if you are not from here, most recently there was a vendor by the name of Maria Falcone who was accosted by NYPD in the subway station and ended up having all of her property seized. And the video went viral and she was interviewed many, many times. But this is the only time that vendors regularly get press. It's when they are harmed by the New York City Police Department or when they're harmed by somebody else. They're often made a spectacle and it's only when that their issues go viral like this is when they get most attention. We don't really see regular content happening on a day-to-day -day basis about street vendors unless it happens to be in that instance. And so my goal with my work was to kind of change that and to kind of bring about the idea that these people deserve their humanity to be recognized on a day-to-day -day basis and not just when they're being harmed. So the way that I've engaged with the vendors um, has been through these means. So in-person events, in-person interactions, call-outs on social media, as well as um, on the ground work and reporting, um, social media content creation, as well as published works. So in-person events, um, for the past several months, I've been trying to get in contact with the Street Vendor Project, and I finally made a breakthrough this past October. The Street Vendor Project is the largest organization working with the street vendor community here in the city. They are under the Urban Justice Center that is based here in the city. And Mohamed Atia, which is pictured there, is the executive director. And so they had an International Street Vendors Day celebration with the Street Vendor Project. And so the project invited several vendors from across the city that they've worked with before to come to the event and to bring their families to have a night of food, music, and games. And it was also the reopening of the Street Vendor Project office within the Urban Justice Center. And it kind of just solidified the fact that this was their home. And uh, Mohammed Atia wanted to make them know that this was their space to collaborate with them and that they're not working above them or for them, but they're working with them to solve their issues. I've also done several in-person interactions with street vendors. Um, most notably, this vendor, his name is Carlos Flores. He is a jewelry vendor on 82nd Street in Jackson Heights. I have bought several pieces from him because they're absolutely beautiful, and he hand makes all of them. And he has been my main contact when working with the street vendor community. Um, he has provided me insight on his personal experiences as well as the experiences of his colleagues. When he would um, hear that sanitation workers or that DCWP inspectors were coming to the street, he would immediately call me and let me know the inspectors came today, we had to run. We had to take away all our stuff and we had to go. Or sometimes they leave their stuff, leaving sanitation to be able to take their tables and chairs and throw them away. And now I'm forcing them again to have to rebuild and redo their work. I've done call outs on social media, like I said, so I did this on my personal Instagram page. And this is the how I was able to get in contact with the Street Vendor Project because one of my friends who followed me on social media had a friend who works for the Street Vendor Project, so they sent this post to them, and everything um, happened afterwards. Um, prior to that, like I said, I've been working on trying to get in contact with them to no avail. They are a underfunded organization. Um, they are not necessarily the best staffed organization, and so um, it's been a lot of work and trial and effort to work with them, but I also understand why they've not gone in contact with me because of those things. I've done under on the ground interactions, so I've had several flyers translated in different languages from Hindi to Spanish to Arabic, and I did this with in collaboration with my um, fellow classmates here on campus. I put a call out on the CUNY Slack and asked folks, if you speak these languages, could you help me out? I gave them compensation for their time, and so I was able to utilize this when going out on the street to try and find more interactions. I also did some content creation, so I have a New York City Vendor Voices page on Instagram, as well as this work that I'm doing right now in my coding class, which is supposed to be a landing page for all the work that I'm doing in honor of New York City Vendor Voices. And finally, some published works. I recently wrote a piece for PRISM back in October about what I've been doing so far and how the New York City has been <laughs> failing unlicensed vendors, um, and I hopefully plan to do more um, follow-up work with them. 
So this is some of the impact that I've had overall. Um, so we have currently 56 followers on Instagram. You too could be a follower on Instagram if you join today at NYC Vendor Voices. Um, I've gained trust from vendors throughout the city. Gracias y bendiciones from Sarah, another vendor in Jackson Heights. Um, I've been in contact with political teams. Um, this is from Astrid Auna, who's a comms director for the New York State Senator, Jessica Ramos, who's been working with the street vendor community uh, consistently throughout the past couple of years. And she said that the cap on vendor licenses creates a vulnerable community of uh, micro entrepreneurs. I've also been educating folks like you guys, as well as other people through word of mouth, social media content, and published works. That's all, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Please enjoy the stickers with the, you know, uh, the, the logo 1.0. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for joining me. Um, my name is Amanda Carey McHugh. I'm a journalist, and I'm also the product of a closed adoption circa 1986. Uh, that means um, that I have there's a lot of unknowns about my background and my birth parents, uh, to which I still don't have the answers. So I wanted to work with adoptees and birth parents who are looking to change the narrative around the way we think about and talk about adoption. So I've engaged with a number of organizations, adoption competent therapists, playwrights, podcasters, and a whole lot of social media. But first, let me take you back to the beginning. This is the first uh, person I connected with, Meet Jack McCarthy. Um, they are very vocal about speaking out about um, complex issues surrounding adoption. And they were the first person to uh, bust many myths for me that even I had as an adoptee about adoption. Um, and that was, that was a quote by them. <laughs> so here's some commonly held beliefs versus the reality. Um, so, a lot of people think that, um, you know, infants, you know, who are adopted at birth, uh, they're fine because they're a blank slate, but talk to any adoption competent therapist and they'll tell you that's just not true. Uh, the reality is that adoption is a trauma, uh, is at any age is a trauma and it can show up in a variety of ways. Um, neurobiologically, children taken at birth suffer from what is called preverbal trauma and adoptees um, have higher rates of depression, attachment and personality disorders, and they're four times more likely to uh, attempt suicide. Another myth is that adoption is this beautiful win-win scenario for all involved. Um, but the reality is that birth mothers feel profound loss, and of the roughly 200 birth mothers that I've talked to, all but one of them would have kept their child if they either could afford it or uh, had placed a children if they had lived in an era where it wasn't commonplace for them to be sent to unwed mother's homes where they were forced to place their children for adoption. Um, this is called the baby scoop era, by the way, in the time between World War II and Roe v. Wade. Um, and uh, the reason is that um, agencies and lawyers have a lot to gain from adoption, from an adoption going through, as it is a for-profit, multi-billion dollar industry with adoption lawyers making upwards of half a million a year. So, over the last 16 months, I've employed a lot of engagement tactics. I've held uh, several listening posts, um, both on TikTok and on Zoom. I've uh, I've done four call-outs uh, posted across several social media platforms. 
as well as sent to a mailing list of the adoption agency, Spence Chapin. Um, and this resulted in 249 responses in total. Uh, and that's the one, as you can see, that got the most responses. Um, and I've also engaged on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And I've gotten some FaceTime, and this is from the Concerned United Birth Parents Retreat uh, last year, and that's, that's Eileen. She and I bonded pretty hard. Um, so there's some key takeaways from all of this uh, engagement. Um, one is that, um, you know, the, the community is extreme, you know, according to the my call outs, the people who answer them, 76% answer that they're, they're extremely dissatisfied with how adoption was being covered um, in, in the media and, and treated by the media. Um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lack of understanding um, about complex adoption issues, which has resulted in harmful reporting methods. Um, and therefore, a lot of them don't trust reporters. Um, there's a lack of stories um, that are complex and nuanced, and there's a lack of stories from birth parents and adoptees' perspectives. Many of them are um, adoptive parent driven. Um, anonymity is extremely important to this community. Um, mostly, the, the top reason they answered is because um, they're concerned about how it will impact their personal relationships. And um, uh, another reason for birth parents is shame. So this is Eileen McQuaid. Uh, she is a uh, birth mother from the Baby Scoop era, and she founded the Catholic Mothers for Truth and Transparency, which was an organization that has uh, unwed uh, women who went to unwed mothers' homes sharing their stories specifically to help legislative change happen. Um, and this is what she said about shame. So the problem here is that because we don't have a lot of people who are willing to go on the record, and traditional journalism generally leans towards stories where people are willing to go on the record, we have a more narrow um, outlook on how adoption is and how it's treated. And um, another problem with that is the people who are willing to speak out are often emotionally exhausted from always being the point person. Um, and so, how we meet that problem is a few different things. Um, so this is Desiree Stevens. Um, she's an adoptee from New York, and she, I met her while I was writing an explainer about how the Catholic Mothers Group helped a group of adoptees get access, I mean, all adoptees in Connecticut, but helped a group who were organizing to get um, adopt, sorry, I, I, um, let me start that sentence again. Um, so Desiree Stevens is uh, an adoptee who's looking to get um, access. I'm sorry, I'm just really nervous. So when I, when I saw that, I got completely thrown off. Um, so Desiree Stevens <laughs> has been working with Catholic Mothers Group to uh, help adoptees in Connecticut get access to their birth certificates. There, I said the sentence. Um, <laughs> And what I've learned from her is that, um, you know, both adoptees and birth mothers, and she's had a lot of experiences working with both groups, um, are victims of a system that oppresses women. Um, and this really showed up after the Dobbs opinion leak. Um, a lot of adoptees uh, were coming out because they were tired of being treated as political props in the adoption as a solution to abortion argument uh, that pro-lifers have been making. So in response to that, I created the Voices of Adoption multimedia multi-platform project. We are on Instagram, TikTok, Substack, and we have a private Facebook group. And for the first post, uh, I, I decided to do it in a format that was ideated in a listening post, which is an audio-only collage, where I interviewed 17 adoptees and I collaborated with Sarah on TikTok, who has a following, where we planned on them posting the prompt, is adoption the solution to abortion? And then I would stitch our response to that video. And that post went viral, as you can see. Um, 142,000 views is pretty cool. Um, and uh, especially the comment section was very active. Um, and since then, I've posted 36 more posts, and in total, I've, I now have almost 4,000 followers. 
And our Instagram is, is not doing too shabby either at 191 followers. Um, and I've done a lot of story posts for that as well. So another way that I've been engaging that's really important is with TikTok Lives. Um, so I have done a couple, I've joined, I joined on other TikTokers lives as a guest. I've also hosted my own listening posts um, more spontaneously and I've done two lives with experts. Um, so this is Gregory Luce, he's an adoptee rights lawyer and we did a live talking about um, the oral argument that the Supreme Court had over whether or not the Indian Child Welfare Act is constitutional and that's direct impact on indigenous adoptees. Um, we also um, talked about mental health and adoption with three adoption competent therapists and you can see that I did it not just on TikTok but on a lot of platforms. And I also, as you can see, there's a lot of impact. <laughs> Um, and this is probably one of my favorite responses and it showed me that a comment section can be hugely impactful. Um, it really creates a community space for people to engage and it's just as important as the posts, if you will. Um, and a lot of how a successful comment section shows up is how you position it and the community you create around your channel. Um, this is a text I got the, right after I hosted the live Ask Me Anything about mental health and adoption, and it was really encouraging to help me keep going in this space. One thing I noticed is adoptive parents and uh, people who are curious about adoption have been um, commenting uh, that they appreciate me uh, being understanding of their questions as adoptee TikTok is not usually very welcoming to them. And so I thought I should have a space where um, we create a space for people who are newer to the space, where it's a centralized information resource hub, which also includes a subscriber chat for people to ask their questions and kind of take them off TikTok and funnel them into the Substack. Um, this includes a curated resource page, which is several uh, crowdsourced padlets for people to add their own resources that they suggest to, a dictionary of terms, since there are a lot of adoption reform specific terms to get to know and different ways to get involved. Um, people can schedule a recording with me on there. They can schedule a uh, press as an opportunity to schedule a consultation with me, hi. Um, and also the call out is on there and um, uh, people can also sign up to join a future listening post. So uh, I, I do have a few subscribers and this is without me even officially launching it. I casually mentioned it in one of my listening posts and I already got my first paid subscriber and her response when she saw it was that this was sorely needed. Um, I soon became known by older birth parents as that adoptee TikToker journalist um, and uh, people were reaching out to me saying they wanted to get involved but they really didn't want to start their own you know, TikTok profile but they still wanted their voices to get heard on the platform. Um, and so I partnered with the Concerned United Birth Parents and also the Catholic Mothers Group, and we created a, a private Facebook group specifically to organize them for the recordings. And I was invited to do recordings at the retreat this past October. I was even given a scholarship and a travel stipend to do this with. Um, as you can see, I engaged a lot with um, both birth mothers and adoptees. It is for the whole triad. And I put in uh, information packets in their folders along with the stickers and a hard copy of the call out I've been doing since I've realized that this group in particular really appreciates hard copies. Um, in addition, this past summer I was an intern at StoryCorps and I wrote a profile last spring on Francine and I pitched her story to StoryCorps and she has an incredible story of resiliency and if you'd like to listen to it, it is now archived at the Library of Congress. So just go listen to it, she's amazing. Um, and I also was interviewed by audiophiles. Some challenges are there have been a lot of pro-life trolls um, and that's been really difficult. Uh, TikTok is a very volatile space um, and I've also had to hold a lot of trauma. I've been holding space for an enormous amount of trauma over the last 16 months and that's forced me to confront my own trauma around adoption. So that's me, for, that's me confronting my own trauma around adoption. So what have I done about it? Well, I created a community guidelines, which is pinned at the top of the, um, uh, which is pinned at the top of the TikTok channel, and I've intentionally set community guidelines with the panelists for every live I've had. We've created them together. 
I have TikTok settings that um, flag certain words uh, to make sure that the comment space um, remains a brave space for people to have discussion. And I've had moderators on every single platform that I've held a live on. I've also, just so you know, been going to therapy twice a week to process everything that uh, I've been going through. And I think it's important to note that when you're doing trauma-informed journalism, you really need that extra support. Um, some other lessons learned are to show up without an agenda. This is me and Eileen at this year's retreat. Uh, I went without an agenda last year, and that planted the seed for the work I was able to do this year. Um, to listen deeply, not just to what people are saying, but they're, what they're demonstrating in their actions, and try to mirror it um, if it's going to be helpful in connecting with that community. Um, also, creating ongoing feedback loops not only helps you optimize uh, the work that you're doing for your community, um, but it also helps to build trust. So what's next? Um, I am going to be a guest on the Safe Home podcast, which is uh, run by an adoptive parent. I'll be, I've been invited by the National Association of Adoptees and Parents to do recordings at the retreat in March in Kentucky. And uh, I'm collaborating with the Catholic Mothers Group and Desiree. We're putting our heads together to create uh, what we're calling the Yelp of adoption agency uh, databases. Um, so that's what's next. And if you want to learn more, please follow me on Substack, Instagram, or TikTok. I, there's no way I have enough time to go into everything that I've done. But I hope you'll check out more of my work there. And if you have any questions, please come talk to me after. Hello, everybody. Hi. Okay. Hi, my name is Isanya Gonzalez, and my project is called Food for Harlem, um, and it focuses on the food insecure population of Harlem. Um, so first, we have to discuss the problem at hand. Um, currently, in New York City, roughly one in three New York City households, or 2.3 million people, lack the funds to cover items like food, shelter, health care, and child care. Um, 1.5 million people are food insecure, uh, meaning they have limited or uncertain access to adequate food. And 3 million people live in high supermarket need neighborhoods, um, and Central and East Harlem are designated in that group of neighborhoods. However, I should warn you that the 3 million people data set is from 2008 and has not been updated since. Um, so, according to the USDA, a food desert is an area that lacks access to healthy and nutritional food. However, the term food apartheid is more appropriate as it addresses the discriminatory socioeconomic structures that create and perpetuate this lack. Um, so, what you're currently looking at is a map of Central and East Harlem and the food insecure population in those areas. Um, food insecurity can actually lead to mental and physical health problems. And uh, during the pandemic, black and Latino households experienced a sharp uptick in food insecurity. Um, in 2021, 21.7% of black households and 17.2% of Latino households experienced food insecurity, while only 7.1% of white households did. Um, and that's important to know because Harlem is a predominantly black and brown neighborhood. Um, and this data is from data to go So if you look in East Harlem, 19.6% of individuals are currently food insecure. And in Central Harlem, 21.5% are. Um, and COVID has only exacerbated these numbers. So as far as um, ins food insecurity in Harlem in the press, um, it almost doesn't exist. Uh, any stories that are published are hyperlocal, and they're not really assisting people in finding resources to help them. Um, it's a brief mention of a celebrity going to a food pantry or 
um, even just local organizations. So City Harvest is in there. Um, they are a local organization based in New York City who do a lot of food work. Um, but that's, again, not a journalistic piece um, that's offering any sort of general knowledge to the public. Um, so this project started when I visited a CSA in Harlem. It's run by this woman. Her name is Judy Desiree. Um, it was originally entitled Bronx Park East CSA, and she changed her name to Uptown Good Food. Um, but in my conversations with the members of this CSA was when this project came about. Um, so Judy was looking for fresh vegetables in her neighborhood, and upon finding a lack, she just decided to do it herself. So her CSA has been around since 2020, and she's partners with a farm in New Jersey. And so spending my time at the CSA and food market days, because she does offer um, a CSA membership, and she also has like a food stand where people who walk by can also purchase fresh vegetables, um, I learned that people who were finding this were often finding it by accident. Um, it was very hard for them to find things like markets, pantries, on purpose. So I decided to create my project. Um, but first, really quick, this is the line outside of Food Bank for New York City um, during their soup kitchen hours in the evening. And that is taken at Uptown Good Food as someone who walked by stopped to purchase some vegetables. Um, so my project is Food for Harlem. It's a resource guide where New Yorkers, um, well, people in Harlem can find food for just organizations in their area. So the goals of this project were really to help people um, find the resources available to them. Um, I also wanted the organizations that exist to be able to access the community they're trying to serve. Um, and really importantly, I think that asking for help is really difficult, especially when it comes to food. So I was hoping to kind of destigmatize the conversation around help and um, finding food in your neighborhood. So um, some of you now have a packet in front of you. And that packet looks just like this. It's um, a flyer with a list of about 70 organizations on it that I distributed in Harlem. Um, and all of the icons indicate what kind of services the location offers. There is also a website. Um, and the website goes a little bit more in depth. It also does have the um, flyer that's in front of you available for download. It has the list. It has a map um, so people can see visually exactly where um, what's closest to them. I also created a section for definitions. On more than one occasion, I have been asked what a community fridge is, what a CSA is, um, and I wanted to make my product as easy and accessible as possible um, because I'm really just creating something to offer help. Um, so I also included a section that talked about an app called Plentiful. Plentiful was created by City Harvest, a organization I mentioned earlier, and it's an app that allows people to reserve their spot at a food pantry. Um, and then, of course, I, I don't live in Harlem, um, so it's very possible that I missed an organization or maybe someone has a suggestion or something to say. I um, really want people's feedback on this, so I created a section for them to comment as well. Um, and so far, so I have distributed the flyers myself in Harlem, but I understand that that is not a measure. Um, the page views are not a measure of the people I have reached. Um, so uh, on top of distributing the flyer myself, I also emailed the website and the flyer to uh, food organizations in Harlem and community organizations because I just wanted to make sure that it was reaching as many people as I could. Um, and two organizations actually got back to me and agreed to distribute it on my behalf. Um, and so things that I'm looking for on the website are page views and how many people are downloading the attached flyer. And so my takeaways. Um, I think that this community was a community that I had to um, show up for, be there in person. They are not a community that exists online because it really can affect anyone and everyone. Um, I also think that even though uh, food access is such a sensitive topic, these people were so willing to talk to me, um, and that was really helpful in helping me learn about the community and what exactly I felt like they needed. Um, and yeah, you can check out the site yourself, um, but thank you.
All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, my name is Julian, and I'm going to pre be presenting about how I used engagement journalism to try and serve my community, uh, the students in New York City public schools. So students are the heart of the education community here in New York City. They're the most directly impacted by the system, and they are the biggest, most important stakeholders. But you might not know that from a lot of mainstream uh, education beat reporting. That's because journalists tend to defer to sources that have authority when they're looking for a quote. They go to administrators, they go to politicians, maybe even business leaders, before asking the students themselves about how a certain policy might affect them in school. It's been my goal to try and change that uh, during the course of grad school. So first, here's a little important demographic information about the student population in New York City. According to data tracked by the Department of, Edu Department of Education in the 2021-2022 school year. So there are a little less than a million students in New York City public schools that go to approximately 1,600 public schools. There's also about 150,000 charter school students that go to 271 different charter schools. For those who don't know, charter schools are publicly funded but privately operated schools in the city. Uh, some more important demographic information, 41% of the student population is, is Hispanic, 24% are black, 16% are Asian, 14% are white, 14% um, are English language learners, meaning they're learning English as a second, third, or even fourth language. Over 20% of the student population has at least one disability that's diagnosed. Uh, about 72% of the student population is considered economically disadvantaged. And nearly one in 10 students are not in a secure housing situation. Uh, so I'm gonna back up for a second and explain why I chose to work with this group of people. So I decided that I wanted to use journalism to uplift student voice when I was working as a teacher in a middle school back in Buffalo, New York. That experience taught me a number of things. Most importantly, that I love working with young people and learning from young people, and it showed me how much I can learn from young people. But it also, uh, there were a couple instances where I heard students who were vocalizing directly to me about how the system or how certain policies in the school weren't working for them. And it was really, really challenging to explain why we had to stick with the status quo. I think a lot of those issues stem from the fact that students don't get to participate in the decisions uh, that impact them in their education system. Uh, and I think that this quote from a source, a uh, high school senior named Jasmine that I interviewed recently really sums up the issue. She said, I feel like a lot of people don't take students seriously. They think, oh, we're too young. We don't know what we're talking about. But we're the ones who are actually in the school. Students are getting affected by everything that adults in power do, everything that, that they implement. So you should talk to the children first about it. So until there are systems in place that allow every student to directly participate in decisions that affect them in a school and in a school system, I think that journalism is a great way to ensure that the school system is accountable to serving the needs of students. I've tried to do that through my reporting by centering student perspectives in my narratives and by listening to their informa information needs first. Uh, so through a, a number of different experiences as a freelance reporter, I have covered issues including um, limited access to mental health care, transportation barriers, school funding, or inadequate school funding, as well as some issues that students had with school government. I did this for City Limits, Hellgate, Gothamist, and more. Uh, that QR code will take you to my portfolio if you're interested. Uh, I also, during my internship in Baltimore over the summer, I created a guide to help other reporters uh, get more youth voices in their education reporting. And I thought this was all great. Uh, I'm really proud of the, a lot of the reporting that I did, but I was still reporting about the community instead of with them. And as we learned in engagement journalism, if you report with your community, your reporting becomes a lot stronger. Um, but there are a lot of challenges to working with uh, students when trying to make journalism. Number one, there's not a lot of access to journalism education in school. 73% of high schools don't have a student newspaper. 
and a lot of the mechanisms within the Department of Education to uplift student voice are insufficient. So I thought it would be really cool if I could find a way to help equip students uh, with the tools and the resources that they need to tell their own stories. So for my practicum project, I created Report Card, which is New York City's new student-powered newsroom dash dash journalism club, dash newsletter, dash educational experience. So Report Card is a club for middle and high school students in the New York City area uh, where I train them, pay them, and provide the resources that they need to publish their own reporting. Our mission is to equip students to be able to do journalism by providing training. We provide resources and we provide guidance. And by we, I mean me. So. <laughs> the training that I provide is based on my experience as a middle school teacher, as a journalism graduate student here at CUNY, and as an independent reporter. Uh, through those experiences, I've come to believe that the best way to get better at journalism is to just to do it and to practice and to build the confidence you need to ask tough questions. So I have my students get started right away. They pick a topic that they find thought-provoking and then they dive right in. And I'm there to provide guidance and support along the way. Uh, when they're finished, like the three students I was working with are all fall, uh, their reporting is published on our Substack newsletter. Uh, the story that the three students I was working with all fall uh, about wrote about was the admissions policies here in New York City. In the future, I also hope to include opinion reporting as well as some multimedia content. Paying students is super important to Report Card's mission because it makes the opportunity accessible to more students. Uh, but it's also super expensive. And unless we're charging subs for subscriptions, which we don't want to do in order to make our newsletter accessible to everybody, uh, we decided that a Patreon would be a good way to raise funds. Uh, so since launching the newsletter a couple weeks ago, I've got a lot of feedback, some positive and some stuff I can learn from. Ryle and Amden and Alex, the three students I was working with all fall, are super proud of their reporting project. Ironically, Rylan was able to use it in his high school admission application. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Amden has joined his student journalism club at school, and all three of them are interested in rejoining for a second time. Seven students filled out my Google form saying that they're interested in joining. Uh, three others did, but they're not living in the area. 40 people subscribed to the newsletter for free. Uh, I shared the, the whole idea with the Youth Journalism Coalition, and I got a lot of positive feedback from them, uh, including a couple opportunities to teach high school journalism. And when I announced on Twitter, I got a bunch of positive, uh, encouraging feedback. Unfortunately, it didn't translate into total financial support. I have five paid supporters on Patreon who I appreciate beyond belief, but uh, that only adds up to $30 a month, which is not enough to pay the seven new students who are interested. So that's why Report Card is an experiment. Uh, it depends on if we're correct that there's enough people out there who care about the mission to provide actual financial support. If I'm wrong, I'm going to have to rethink about how I'm fundraising or whether or not it's sustainable to continue to pay students. So if you believe in Report Card's mission, there's the QR code to the Patreon, which you can find on this slide as well. Thank you very much. All right, hi friends. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about my experience with reporting on and working with uh, the New York City running community and my time in the EJ program or engagement journalism program. 
So to give you a little background of sort of, or I guess an overview of what I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to start with why I felt like I was a good person to report on this community and work with them, and then I'm going to talk, talk to you about how I um, came up with the idea for what I wanted to do for my practicum, and then the planning for it, um, some sort of snags that I ran up into, and then how that informed what I ended up doing. And so let's first talk about why I felt like I was a good person to do this. Um, I've ran all my life. It's something I'm very passionate about. It's something that um, I've, like I, I've reported on my entire time throughout here at CUNY. So in the top right, that's uh, running to protest or define New York. And all these groups I've ran with, I went to their events, I've reported on, um, I've built relationships with. That's um, also running to protest in the bottom left-hand corner. That's Front Runners New York, an LGBTQ group of runners. Uh, that's Kelvin Coffey. He's a filmmaker and the uh, founder of Running to Protest and Define New York. Define New York is a group that does destination runs to learn about different areas in the city. And then that's Ilya Tarasenko, who is a connection I made, who's the uh, founder and leader of South Brooklyn Running Club. And I, uh, over the time of my work with in, at CUNY, I published some stories on um, these communities and while working with them. So this, um, both are for Brooklyn Magazine, and that was with like running to protest and define New York, uh, the one about um, lacing up for activism. And then the one on the right was sort of tangentially um, connected to the running community. It was with my work with South Brooklyn Running Club and learning about uh, Red Hook Track and Red Hook Park being ripped up. And then all of a sudden that grew into a bigger story about how Amazon was putting in fulfillment centers in the neighborhood and how that neighborhood was going under a lot of changes that residents weren't particularly thrilled with. And then the bottom is uh, sort of a story that I worked on with folks that I had interacted with and partnered with. Um, members of Prospect Park Track Club and others to sort of give a guide to people that are trying to enter their way into running or the running community for the first time. And so lots of ties to the community through different work that I've done. And through that, I also did, so this is all connected to that Red Hook story. So I did a data story uh, for one of the classes talking about the lack of green space in some of these neighborhoods and so why uh, ripping up that track and taking out all the natural grass and replacing it with artificial turf is a big deal. And then also sort of getting, I got a statement from Amazon about why they felt like um, it was a good idea. And then this is a, a community member that I connected with and did a little sort of uh, video extension of that article. And this was some of that impact. So that's uh, a DM from that same community member, Matthias and uh, sort of alerted me about people talking about my story on uh, Red Hook um, community chats on Facebook. And um, that was really encouraging for me to see just that conversations were being started because of sort of the conversations I had with folks in the community. And then so this kind of led me to uh, come up with what I wanted to do for my event. And so I think it's important to note that with running, uh, showing up is sort of the biggest thing. Um, I can't really overemphasize that enough. Like in, in our program, we sort of look to explore different options of how do people uh, communicate with each other? Like what online forums are people talking on? And for the running community, it's uh, the in-person meeting for the run is sort of, that's where all the news is talked about. That's where people talk about the health of the community, the um, Every, the issues, the wins, the successes. And so I felt as though that I would be doing a disservice to the community or I wouldn't be doing what I learned from the community leaders that I connected with if I didn't hold an in-person event or try to do my own version of that. And so this is a call out I distributed in the spring. I got 115 responses and just a lot of people talking about uh, the issues, the successes, um, access, uh, things about access and diversity and uh, cost of things and run like running shoes and stuff like that. And so this was the event that I attempted to hold and I was, 
uh, for my first event, I think I was very excited about it and it wasn't by any means a failure and I think I'm wrapping my head around that. I just didn't have the turnout that I wanted and I think a lot of that was because I didn't strategically partner with sort of the community members and people that I, I told them about my event, I encouraged them to come with it, come to it, but it wasn't held in tandem with them. And so I learned a lot from that. We had great discussions about the community and the health of it and what needs to improve, what's working. Um, and those were some note cards that I took from the call out and brought to the run. And then that's sort of what I felt like that was a dress rehearsal for what I wanted my uh, event in this fall to look like. And so for this fall event, I tried to have a second crack or a second go at hosting a run. And so I, for doing that, uh, plan to do that with Victoria Lowe, who's uh, the founder and leader of Chinatown Runners. And I was, I had most recently reported on an event with her. This is us in Flushing. Um, and I had a, have a really good working relationship with her, so I felt like that was a great person to partner with. And in planning the event, I also partnered with my uh, workplace. I work at a running studio, and so I felt like having that, my clients, my customers, people that have come to that, um, know about the run was going to create maybe a little bit more traction. This was sort of me course correcting for what I feel like I didn't do well the first time. And so then um, that's sort of the description of that. And then uh, for some of the fallout was that Victoria ended up having to cancel, and it was a lot to do with just sort of um, just unfortunate timing things um, with feeling like she didn't want to step on the feet of other people in the community that were also hosting events around the same time, and so I was kind of thrown into a limbo, and this happened a week before the event was supposed to start, and so then I decided with the encouragement of my boss at the running studio that I work at, that I was gonna forge on and continue with the event. So I held that last Sunday, eight people came out and we had a really great time. We ran a 5K and uh, to the West Side Highway, talked about how everyone got into running, how they feel about the New York City running community. And I felt like that was a really great turnout for an uh, event where you're not necessarily getting anything. We're just talking about sort of the overall state of a community that you participate in every day or about that. And um, this was sort of the link to my call out that I created and I asked people that showed up to my event to fill out that call out. And here's some quotes from that call out and I'm gonna read them and you know, I try not to read from the slides too much but I think you'll, um, I will now. Uh, the little bit of research I've done into running clubs shows that most of them revolve around folks who work a traditional nine to five schedule, either early morning or early evening. I work in hospitality, and so those hours don't tend to work for me. Running groups should be holistic when it comes to fitness and safety. I believe every running group should have people in each workout that know first aid and are CPR certified. In addition, warm ups, cool downs, and access slash suggestions or the creation of additional prehab, rehab, strength, and conditioning should be emphasized. And so a lot of that, what that told me was that um, when I communicated back with people who filled out my call out who came to my run saying, hey, this were, these were some of the responses. Maybe these are things that we should think about in the future based off our discussion we should have. We should think about accommodating more people's schedules. We should think about making more people feel welcome with what we're doing at these runs when we show up. Um, that's a sort of all I got. I'm going to be doing audience work for the Dallas Morning News um, starting at the end of the year. And um, so if you want to follow along with some of what I'm doing, you can uh, check, check that out there. This is the last presentation. If y'all need to like, yes. <laughs> um, so if y'all need to like take a deep breath or like a quick stretch break while I get these slides going, I very much encourage that. We've been sitting here for a long time. I think
think we're ready. Last one. <laughs> um, so my name is Christine Vernicholas, and I'm interested in the types of concrete information that people in New York need as the climate changes. So I've been working with folks in New York, particularly Brooklyn and in Queens, that are impacted by flooding. This is because New York City is surrounded by water. Over 520 miles of coastline, um, and most of New York City before colonization and development was a marsh, a wetland, or a pond. That means now that over 1.3 million New Yorkers, so that's everyone who lives in those blue sections, are at risk of coastal flooding. It does mean that they may be a little bit more familiar with what to do if that happens, since it's been prevalent for a long time. Um, but because of increased severity of storms and rainfall, um, like we saw last summer with Hurricane Ida, millions more New Yorkers are now at risk of stormwater inland flooding. So this affects neighborhoods all over the place, even miles away from the coast. And it happens when too much rain falls in a short amount of time and the sewer capacity in New York can't handle it. So it overflows. Um, right now, to even take the first step, and understand like, is this a problem for me? Is my home at risk for flooding? You have to check two different maps on two different websites and resources to deal with the impacts of this flooding are scattered across lots of city and organization websites. And what does some blue on a map look like for people? So this is from a project um, by Pablo Herreros Cantus who became one of my collaborators on this project. He geolocated areas of flood maps with tweets from Hurricane Ida to show the impact in real time. So this is an example um, in Brooklyn, and the type of impact that flooding can have is not only destruction of property, like cars or basements or first floors, memories, all of that stuff, um, but it can also have health impacts. Uh, flood waters are often toxic and filled with huge big chemicals, and uh, it can be deadly as well. So 40 people died during Hurricane Ida last summer. Um, and while like, this flooding does look different block to block, it's important to note that it does tend to be worse in areas that have been historically disinvested, often due to redlining and other racist city practices over time. So it's, um, it's a big topic. And uh, to, to dig in, I needed to start talking to people. So after my initial research phase, where I was going to events and attending community board meetings, and doing a lot of reading, um, I sent this call out to as many community organizations related to water as I could, which ended up being about 20. Uh, 34 people responded, and from that, I was able to do 11 deeper interviews with folks. So learned lots of stuff, um, everything from not parking on corners, because that floods more, um, to some, some different types of resources that people who rent rather than own their homes need. And um, then I wanted to learn about some of the other types of projects that were happening around the city um, that were gathering data about water and flooding in the city. Because, like Victoria says, in doing the research ourselves, we can prove that what the government is doing is insufficient. So community members are doing this work. They're measuring uh, stuff in their backyards. Um, and I wanted to map some of this work. By no means comprehensive, but I did talk to several people <laughs> across the city, and that's how I met Roger. Um, he lived in Hamilton Beach uh, for a long time, and he started a Facebook group in his neighborhood uh, called Community Flood Watch. So people would uh, take photos outside their homes when a, a storm happens and record that as a um, like documentation of what they're experiencing often to be able to bring to like community boards or city council members to ask for assistance and advocate for themselves. Um, let's see, Roger. Yeah, okay. Um, so then I listened to some more. I took this out across the city uh, over the summer to some listening posts. So I was out in Coney Island for the City of Water, um, city of Water Day event there. And also, um, like Asania, spent some time with CSA folks in Sunset Park, basically just like waiting for people as they were waiting for their vegetables. <laughs> um, so from all of that, I heard four key needs from folks. One, how can I find out what my risk is? And then what do you do next? Are there super local early warning systems? So stuff like um, 
the types of projects that happen with citizen science. And how can you fix problems that you already know about? So if something has been broken on your block for years, like what do you do? And how do you navigate that process with the city, which can be different with every single storm that happens? So um, I developed, oh, also you have to make it fun and easy to use because it's like a challenging topic and no one wants to think about disasters. So I developed this zine. Um, you're, you can have one too in a second. And this is um, a booklet of different actions that people can take to make it easier for folks to find all that information in one place and break it down by like one thing at a time to make it approachable as it is a big topic. Um, and if you follow the QR code on the front of that zine, it brings you to this landing page. So this is where you can go more in depth on all the different actions um, and also find different stories. So this is an example of how to get like help if your landlord isn't repairing anything in your apartment and also an example of some of the longer form articles that are on the site. I also did an Instagram page because I was at an event and someone was like, how can I follow you on Instagram? And I didn't have one yet. <laughs> um, so that's been a great place to share some of the other interviews that I did with folks in a shorter form way as well. Then um, I wanted to take these zines out into the world. And the first way that I did that was through the Rainy Day Play, which is a musical comedy, yes, musical comedy, about uh, rain and about people's emotional connection to rain and um, in flood sensors, actually, because they are part of FloodNet, which is a uh, sensor system that's being installed across the city. They had an artist residency as part of their early outreach to the community as well. That can act as a hyperlocal early warning system. Um, so I attended a few of their performances, um, shared my zines with folks, and did a lot of uh, recordings of interviews to learn about other people's rainy day stories too. And um, Nicholas and Sabina, who are the creators, uh, very kindly offered to share this final project uh, with all the people who had attended those plays as well. And then um, I wanted to get them out in the world more. So I went to more <laughs> different events. Um, so to the Barnacle Parade and Red Hook, which happens every year, to CMB Plus 10, which is a conference of community organizations um, at that 10 year anniversary this October. Filmed a few different um, <laughs> pieces for Instagram with some volunteers uh, with We Act, which is another organization in the city, and even mailed some zines to a group that does bike tours of flood resilience projects. That will be happening in the spring because it's really cold out there. Um, and then looking ahead, there's a couple of other organizations that I started conversations with. So Port Portside, New York, understanding how this, um, these resources can complement their existing outreach and education work. And also, um, We've got the center, which is a group of young environmental activists. Um, I think it'd be great to work with them kind of in a workshopping setting and maybe even make some more zines together. Um, so impact, um, we've talked a lot about different types of metrics. About 200 people have visited my website so far, but I really think like so many people have talked about tonight, it's the relationships that are important. So um, these are a couple of things that Carolina and Roger shared as some of the folks that I've talked with the most over the course of this time. I also learned a lot during this <laughs> very long process of the last 15 months. So the first thing, obviously, is so much about New York City sewers. Never thought that would happen. Um, <laughs> then also, just sometimes the answer is not more information, but just infrastructure investment. And so there are limits to this work. Sometimes the city just needs to follow through on its own promises. And um, as again, many people have said, showing up, super important. And um, one of the ways that I knew that I was sort of on the right track there was when I started getting reintroduced to the same people. It's like, okay, getting into the community, getting into the space. And another key thing was to share my work early and often and usually before I was ready, um, <laughs> but those were the times when the feedback that I received from folks I shared it with was most impactful and really made for a stronger project at the end. 
Also, thank you to everyone who helped me fold beans. <laughs> and thank you to all of you for being here. Um, you made it through a long night of presentation, so thank you. Didn't they do an absolutely wonderful job? Woohoo! Yay! Um, we have some food out in the, ca at least I think we do have been in here, <laughs> but in theory we have some food out in the cafe area, so everyone's welcome to join us for that. And yeah, thank you all for coming. <laughs> So we wanted to say thank you to all our amazing professors here in the engagement program. Y'all, we would not be here obviously without you all. So this is why we got some little gifts with the help of everyone in the program to you know, distribute. Yeah, specifically uh, to all the, the practicum <laughs> folks um, and thank you to everyone for being here who's helped us in our journey from the very beginning.